Hi, this is Mr. Barron, and we're going to begin by talking about atomic theory. So, this is the PowerPoint that most of this lecture is going to be on, and I would like you to take notes on this entire presentation and make sure you understand or at least have a strong grasp of uh, the concepts that are within this presentation. So, uh, you should have either already begun taking notes on a section titled LA Modern Atomic Theory, or you want to begin them anew. And let's get started. So what we're really trying to do in this lecture is figure out what an atom actually looks like. One of the ways that we study atoms is actually through light, so we have to take a little detour and talk about how light works. See, light, when we see white light, what happens is it bends when you go through new materials, and this is due to a change in speed. So one of the ways that we can take advantage of measuring what light is is through a thing called a spectroscope. And you can take a light source, you can put it through a prism, and then the light changes speeds, and based on how it changes speeds, it bends, and based on what type of wavelength you are, whether you are red, yellow, green, blue, you bend different amounts, and then you can actually make measurements of the wavelengths of light. So there are two important things to notice about spectroscopes. There are spectroscopes that work as a or record op when you record observations you see what's called a continuous spectra versus a discrete line spectra. Whenever you get uh, the colors blending in together, that's what we call a continuous line spectra. When you see these unique lines separated from the other colors, that's a discrete line spectra. Alright, so what is light? Well, light's uh, part of the electromagnetic spectrum and the electromagnetic radiation that makes up the electromagnetic spectrum is energy that can travel through space with both wave-like and particle-like properties. Looking at this prism here, I've got white light coming in, being refracted in the prism, and you separate out the wavelengths. One of the words I'm going to be using throughout this presentation is the word photon, and a photon is a packet of electromagnetic radiation. Now let's talk about the wave-like particles of electromagnetic radiation. So uh, here's a diagram illustrating the various features of a wave. We have the peak, the trough, and wavelength and amplitude. We're mostly going to be just looking at wavelength because that's the only difference between all types of electromagnetic radiation. It's the wavelength, not the amplitude, not the speed necessarily. We're concerned about the wavelength primarily. By the way, peak is also often referred to as crest as well. Alright, so let's take a look at the electromagnetic spectrum, which is obviously energy traveling through space, everything from radio waves all the way to gamma rays. What's different between each of them is the wavelength. If you look on the left side here, we see that large wavelengths are low in energy and shorter wavelengths are higher in energy. The reason is, is that if light is all traveling the same speed, it's moving the speed of light, what happens when you're dealing with large wavelengths is you have less crests or peaks pass by per second. Now, how many peaks pass by, the top of the wave, pass by per second is what we call frequency. So if you have a large wavelength, you have a low frequency and a lower energy. If you have a short wavelength, you're going to have more peaks pass by per second, so you have a higher frequency and also a higher energy. Notice in the electromagnetic spectrum that visible light is just a narrow band of all the possibilities in terms of waves that travel through space and are, part of, are classified as electromagnetic radiation. Now, let's talk about the relationship between wavelength, frequency, and energy. Just as I was saying before, the larger the wavelength, the lower the frequency and the lower the energy. So frequency and energy have a direct relationship. So I have low frequency here, low energy, and I have high frequency here and high energy. So those are examples of a direct relationship. When one's big, the other's big. When the other one's small, the other one's small. Wavelength and energy have an inverse relationship. The larger the wavelength, the lower the energy. Same with on this side. The shorter the wavelength, the higher the energy. Don't forget Roy G. Biv on the visible spectrum, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Uh, red is much larger in wavelengths, violet's much shorter in wavelengths, hence you could make an energy comparison between the two. All right, let's talk about the equations that explain each. The top one explains the relationship between frequency, speed, and wavelength. Speed of light being constant, it's always a constant, you can see the inverse relationship between frequency and wavelength. When frequency is large, wavelength is small. Then there's also this equation down here, which we're going to occasionally touch on, which shows the direct relationship between frequency and energy. The, the symbol H is Planck's constant, which doesn't change, 
and you have frequency equal to the energy for the most part of the light that's traveling, particularly photons, and you can make an energy comparison. Now let's talk about some electron models. Um, this is a point where I'm going to take a detour from my pictures that I have on my PowerPoint to a simulation. Now we're going to be looking at a hydrogen atom. So let's reset this simulation. We're looking at what's called the Bohr model for a hydrogen atom. Now remember, electrons don't orbit the uh, nucleus like this, but we can pretend like they do and a lot of times to explain a lot of the behavior of light. Let's go to the first idea of atoms, which were that there are just these solid objects. Now, if we shine light at a particular wavelength right at this solid object, bounces right off. This is not what happens in reality for atoms. Now let's look at the plum pudding model. Here's the plum pudding model. Let's shine some light on it. And you see that it doesn't fully explain what we actually see happening with an atom. Now let's look at the classical solar system. Ooh, doesn't last long at all. So the classical solar system model basically explains that you would have an electron that would crash into the nucleus. Uh, so electrons don't behave like planets in a solar system. The Bohr model, electrons aren't spinning around in a predictable pattern, but they are in a predictable energy level or shell of energy. So what happens is that when you shine light on it, that electron can get excited, jumps to a higher energy level, then falls back down to a lower energy level and emits some light. So let's explore the Bohr model a little bit further with this animation. So in this animation, we're looking at the Bohr model and what happens if I add energy to the electron? Well, just as you get energy, you get excited. If I give you caffeine or sugar, you're going to get excited. So let's add some energy to the atom. And the electrons can absorb that energy. And as the photons absorb, the electron becomes excited because it has a lot more energy. Can't stay excited forever. It's going to crash down just like you on sugar. And it falls down to a lower energy level. Notice the color of light that's emitted. It's red light. Notice it only fell from the third energy level to the second energy level. Not very far of a gap. So the energy that was released was not that high, hence red light. Now let's add another photon of energy. This photon of energy gets absorbed by the electron and it jumps all the way up to the fifth energy level. Now at the fifth energy level, the atom is extraordinarily excited, can't sustain it, and it falls back down. When it falls back down, this time pay attention to the color of light that's emitted. Oh, it's a blue or violet colored light. Higher energy. So the further you fall back down, the higher the energy you release. And it also takes a lot of energy to knock you up there. So the electron's not orbiting the center of the atom, the nucleus. Instead, they're in these shells. And as you get higher and higher in energy, you get further and further away from the nucleus. So now let's go back to this animation. Now, the same thing happens. When I shine ultraviolet light at it, when it hits the electron, ultraviolet light has a lot of energy, causes the electron to be excited all the way to the highest energy level, then emit light. And the light that's emitted depends on, let me show the spectrometer, we can actually see what type of light is emitted when the electron falls back down. So anyhow, now what we're going to do is talk about uh, another model of the atom, which is the Broglie wave function model and the Schrodinger equation. These models get really complex and basically we have to start thinking of electrons behaving a lot like light behaves. And it's really tough to understand unless you're in higher levels of math. So what we're going to do is we're not going to focus on that as much as we're going to focus on the Bohr model. Now back to the uh, the PowerPoint presentation. So we know that the old plum pudding or electron cloud model isn't the reality anymore. We know that electrons exist at energy levels. Each energy level in the atom we're going to call electron shells. And think of these energy levels as rungs on a ladder. The higher the energy level, the further away you are from what's called the ground state. So when a electron absorbs energy, it becomes excited. Then when it falls back down, it emits light. Now, how that atom emit, or how that electron when it falls back down, depending on how far it falls, determines what type of light that's given off. This is something that you'll cover if you ever take a class called physical chemistry in college. Now, here's a cartoon to illustrate the concept. Leo and the electron was not sure just to where he'd been blasted when the photon struck, but indicators suggest he was now in one of the atom's degenerate orbitals. 
So the further you fall, the higher the energy level you've been in, the higher the energy you release. This is another slide that shows a good example of it. Um, we can actually use photon emission. Each element emits its own type of wavelength. So now we're going to go to another simulation. And let's look at the difference between a couple of different atoms. So this is hydrogen. And look at the bottom. And you see there's specific wavelengths that are being emitted for hydrogen. Some red, some purple, some blue, some sort of greenish blue. And that's what's happening when the electrons are jumping up and falling down to these various uh, states. And how far they fall determines the type of light or electromagnetic radiation that's given off. See the signature for hydrogen. Now let's look at the signature not just for hydrogen, let's look at the signature for sodium. And as you can see, sodium emits a very different type of light. And the electrons are in different locations, so how they fall down and how far they fall down releases different wavelengths, and hence you see different colors. So going back to the PowerPoint presentation once again, we can use these spectra to identify elements. So you can see that hydrogen gives off red wavelengths of light, and then this greenish blue, then darker blues, purples, and so forth. So depending on the type of light you emit when you excite the electrons, you can use that because it's like a fingerprint of an element. And that's how we would identify how stars are made, or what stars are made of, is based on the light that's given off. So where exactly are all those electrons? Let's talk about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. We can never know the exact location of an electron or any particle, only a probability of where it might be. Every time you make a measurement to see where a particle is, that measurement moves the particle you were originally measuring. So this is an example of a cloud where it's just a probability of where the electron's located. In this case, it's a spherical shape. Now, this actually has to do with things like the Schrodinger equation, which describes why we can never know what's actually happening. Um, the Schrodinger cat equation is enrichment, so if you want to see the videos on the Schrodinger cat equation, uh, all you have to do is go to these different YouTube sites, and I will be posting them on my website for you to listen about the Schrodinger cat theoretical experiment. And here's another comic strip. Dilbert talking about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. You can pause it and read it. It's somewhat interesting. All right, another comic strip about Schrodinger's cat. Uh, again, I recommend watching the YouTube video for enrichment, and then watching, reading, pausing, and look, taking a look at this uh, this comic strip. And here's where we're really getting to: is the quantum mechanical model of the atom. Is that these electrons? fill into these orbitals and they just have a probability of being located in there. So how do we count where electrons are located in these orbitals? How do they fill into these orbitals and how do they go further out from the nucleus? Well this is where we get into a excellent tutorial on my website. So here's my website. Click on the unit pages for honors chemistry. All of this stuff about electrons is in the periodic table unit which is chapter or unit 4. Click on that and then what I would like you to do is click on all of the learning goals on the left. All the learning goals particularly dealing with the modern view of the atom, the quantum model. If you didn't learn from me how to do electron configuration, what I'm highlighting now is probably the most useful, which is the tutorial. This tutorial really does an excellent job of explaining how to write out electron configuration. Let me highlight this. This does an excellent job on how to count valence electrons, which are the electrons furthest on the outside. On the right side here, besides the self-check quizzes, you're going to see the podcast posted. You're also going to see links to the YouTube videos on the Schrodinger equation and Heisenberg uncertainty principle. I'd like you guys to check those out as well. And if you have any other questions, please see me doing tutoring or ask a question in class. Thank you.